Hello and just a great big old welcome to you. We're glad you decided to join us today at 3AVN Worship Hour. We're glad you decided to spend this time with us and I believe it's going to be a profitable hour as we spend it studying the Word of God together. Our subject is darkness shall cover the earth. There's a lot to this. Don't let the title fool you. There's a lot to it. So we pray that each one of you have your Bible, pencil and paper and get ready to look some of these passages up. If we move too quickly, be sure you jot these things down. So you can go back, study to show yourself approved unto God. Again, we're glad, so very grateful and thankful for what you do, your prayers, your support of 3ABN. God bless you for it. Continue it going, continue to pray for us as we move forward. Darkness shall cover the earth. Now, always our custom is, and it should be, is to pray before we get into the Word of God. So I'm just going to step over here. I'm going to kneel, and maybe you'll pray with me, will you? Okay, let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we truly thank you for this opportunity and privilege we have to come before thee. We invite thy Holy Spirit, please come upon us in a very special way. Illuminate these beautiful truths of your word that we may understand them. They may be clear to us and then give us power, strength, and might that we want to be obedient to your word. Thank you for every viewer, every listener, each and every one that will make a decision for you today. And we're going to thank you for that in advance. Bless now, we pray as the word goes out in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, and I know that you do have your Bible, I want you to make sure that you turn in with me. I'm going to read the first passage here. This is one of the most special, special passage to me in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now you'll say, oh, I know that one. Well, I'm glad you do. We, we commit these things to our heart and to our mind. But I love it because the Bible says, in the beginning was what? Good. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Notice this, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, now notice this, and the darkness comprehended it not. You know, I, I love those verses, but when it comes down to the very last line of it, it's something just kind of sticks in my heart and my mind, and there's a sadness that comes up because it says right here that the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus came to this world, but what? Hmm, many people still today looking, they haven't comprehended what it's all about. So again, one of my favorite passages, and spend some time studying that. You know, their, their light, I'm finding this, their light and glory in the truth. And this truth that we just read in this passage of Scripture here, that was Jesus was with God the Father before the foundation of the world. I love that. This is the light shining, the Bible says, in dark places. He was the fountain of life to the world. He was, the Bible says, the eternal Word. He consented to be made flesh. God became man. He was numbered with the transgressors. See, he didn't die a hero. Think about it in the eyes of the world. He died a condemned criminal. He died as man's substitute. Jesus died in order to fully meet the demands of the broken law which the Bible says is death. The wages of sin is death. Now, let's take a little trip, if you don't mind. Let's go back just a little bit here. And uh, as we talk about darkness shall cover the earth at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. Let's go back and look at the time because I believe there's some parallels there at the time that Christ was born and the time that we're living in now just before Jesus comes back again. It behooves us to put these together by the grace of God. You see, the nation was struggling They were struggling internally. They were struggling externally. There was strife, all kind of commotion. Things were going on at the birth of Christ. In fact, it becomes so bad that the office of the high priest was corrupt. It was secured by fraud. 
It was, think about this, fraud and bribery and even, notice this, murder. The priesthood had become corrupt. The people fighting to make ends meet. They were heavily taxed. Might sound familiar for today's time, does it not? Things that are going on. The world's in turmoil right now because we're looking at the nearness of the coming of Jesus Christ. We look at the state of affairs and what happened because the things that were going on here, uh, people were discontent. They were uneasy. They were looking for something that they couldn't find. And not long with discontentment, we find there was frequent outbreaks. My, does that sound like today? People are unrest. They're looking for something and there's outbreaks. There's, huh, today we'd call them maybe protest. Nothing wrong if it's done properly, but when it's not done properly, hmm. See, there was greed. There was violence. There was distrust. A lack of spiritual interest. Sounds familiar, does it not? There's a, this Laodicea, this sleepy, this indifference that was going on even in the church. There's a lot of hatred at the time of Christ's birth, one against another. Sounds like today, awful lot of hatred going on, a lot of things going on out there in the world today that certainly points us to the coming of Christ. But these things, you see, they were happening at the birth of Jesus Christ. Of course, this and much more, you could go on and on with the list. It caused the nation to just want to give up. I don't know if you've ever come to that point in your life that you felt like everything's going haywire. And you just want to just, like, give up. Some will say, well, what, what's the use to continue on? There seems to be no hope. There's darkness in the land. Things are going on that I just can't understand. And uh, along with that darkness and along things that were going on, people became, I use the word, they were depressed and oppressed. They considered their situation <laughs> They were seeing here, think about this, the rulers and the leaders. Think about the leaders and the rulers were thirsting for power. Hmm. That was the rule of the day. And of course, Satan was working. There was a dark shadow that was cast over the world, as it were, and it became darker and darker. I want these to resonate in your mind of what's going on in the world today, Put it however you want to put it. But there is darkness in the land. Something is terribly wrong. And it's getting darker and darker. At the time of Christ's birth, there was a tremendous change that needed to take place. Before the coming of Jesus, there's a great change that needs to take place. And very few want to make that change. You think about what's happened here with even the people of God here. We were called to be His representatives. See, I like that. We were called to be his representatives. But notice the Jews, now I'm going to say this nicely as I can, but they had become the representation of Satan. They had turned their back on God. And now they were followers of the enemy and something had to give. Deception of sin at the birth of Christ had reached its height. I wonder if has it reached its height today. I wonder if it's going to get a little bit worse before Jesus comes. Are there things that we need to be preparing for? After all, darkness is going to cover the earth. And as darkness is already... Don't say this. Oh, darkness is going to one day cover the earth. Darkness is covering the earth right now. But certainly it's going to get darker. Why? Because individuals are becoming right now victims of Satan. Victims. Hmm. because he was behind all this corruption we were talking about. He was behind all this unrest, and that's today too, and all the violence, all the murder, all the destructive practices, hoping to catch men in these things and keep them still in that until they're lost. The time of Christ, there are many of the bodies of human beings. You know, bodies of human being was meant to for, for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. We were there to dwell in the Spirit of God. Notice the Spirit of God inside of us. But it, what had happened, they be, the body became the dwelling place of demons. I wonder today, some of the things I see going on in the world, it looks more like demons, doesn't it? Demon possession. 
A lot of things are going on that we need to be questioning today, and are they pointing us to the coming of Jesus? Now, how, do we, how can we say that, you know, with the human beings, and, you know, it's a dwelling, they're supposed to be the dwelling place of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. I love this, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, the Bible says. I'll say it over and over, but I can't help it because that's what the Bible says. It starts out with what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of God? Hmm, know ye not your body is what? The temple of what? The Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, ye are not your own. You know, I like when you say you're not your own. It'd be nice for us to understand we, we are not our own. We have been bought. We have been purchased with a price. So for we, what? we glorify God in our bodies. Praise God for that. I've often wondered, you know, I, when I did something maybe wrong at home or whatever, and I came home, uh, my mother would say to me sometime, Kenny, what have you been up to? And I'm going, what? She said, what's well, all over your face? Really? Think about it today. Human faces, the people that we pass by in the street or in the car, wherever it might be. People that you meet, friends, family, many, their life is written upon their face. It's many times you can tell what kind of life they are living. Today, some people's lives are crying out for something that they're not seeing, maybe even in the church that they're not seeing anywhere, and yet their voices are lifted up in prayer and saying, God, I need something. I need direction. I need to know, know what to do to be ready. Do you realize that heaven is not your home and not my home? What good? What good has this life been? The whole purpose of us being here is to repopulate heaven. We've missed our purpose if we miss heaven. So we don't want to do that. And I think sometimes that Satan laughs as he sees how he has debased the image of God in humanity. Have you thought along those lines? Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 gives us direction on this. Notice, you say, well, I, I'm not sure about where, but are we supposed to be in the image of God? How were we created? How were we made? What are we doing? You know? Well, the Bible tells us, Genesis 1 26. Just the first few words we'll use on that. Notice it says, and God said, now, if you don't know, I love this. And God said, let us make man in what? In our image after our likeness. That just answers the question for me. I don't need any more information because God said we're to be made in his image. And so I'm just kind of thinking, you know, don't, don't, we need to act like we're in his image. We are his people. We are his representatives. Surely maybe we're beginning to see or maybe you're finding out as you're studying and praying every day and witnessing for Him. That He has a plan for you and a plan for your life. But many people don't know that. And you know what? If I look at humanity as a whole today, I think it's totally out of control. There needs to be a change. But you know, if we just left it there, you know, what good would it do us? I'm glad the Bible gives plenty of good counsel, but it notice what it says. But there's some good news here. All is not lost. Praise God for that. It's not lost. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 gives us some real good, exciting news. But when the fullness of time was what? When the fullness of time was come. See, this is a good news. Why? Because they were in a dark part of earth's history. But when the fullness of time was come, what happened? The Bible said God sent forth His Son. Man, he had a plan. You can look at the exact time. In fact, it won't be on the screen, but just jot down uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. Jesus came at the exact time that he said he would do. It was predicted, as we well know, Acts uh, chapter 17, verse 26. But the right, right time, it said, God sent forth his son made of a, notice the Bible said, of a woman. It, what does it do? It indicates his humanity made under or subject to the law to redeem. I like that, to, to buy back. Man, I need to be purchased. I need to be bought. You know, he, he, he paid with his blood, did he not? Them that were under the law, literally that means under law, which was the Jewish legal system, that we might receive the adoption of sons. What it, to me is exciting when I read the scriptures and it says sons and daughters, Sons of God, daughters of God. 
What a privilege that is and how many times many people spurn that. They look at the world and things going on. They just wonder, well, we've we, 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 we got to find an answer here. We, we're going to have to go here. We're going to have to do that. But we have to realize we are in this time of the coming of the, we talked about the bridegroom. Remember the Bible said in Matthew 25, the coming of the bridegroom was at midnight. Wow, what do you mean at midnight? That was the darkest hour. And so we know that the coming of Christ, <laughs> notice this, takes place in the darkest period of earth's history. So we need to be prepared for that. And what does God do? Well, I know this. He calls us to reflect His light. He calls us to reflect His glory. And look how often we fail that. We reflect somebody else's glory, maybe, or somebody else's envy. We, we, we're not reflecting the light from the throne room of God, His glory. And that's for I thinking right now we need to be shining a light. We need to be uh -oh, lighting a candle so for the world to see. I love the passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1, 1 through 3. Man, do they have special application to God's New Testament church or to His people today. Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 through 3. Again, the Bible says, I like this, arise and shine. You know, why does it start out arise and shine? Because we've been seated way too long, that's why. And God said He wants us to get with the program. I want you to rise up. We can't really do anything as we're seated. We need to get up and where we can move them out and do what God asks us to do. Arise and shine. Notice, for thy light is what? The light is come. <laughs> Boy, you think about this right here. But notice, when we talk about this passage of Scripture, arise and shine, for the light is come, it's talking about here, remember, these promises that I'm, I'm going to read here and I'm reading, it, is, it was a condition of what? Of the Re Reformation that would be taking place in Isaiah chapter 58. See, God made some promises here, but they were conditional. And what Israel failed of, that, of those conditions. And therefore, listen, this passes over to the New Testament church. These are our hours for today. Grasping. So when I read it, it says, arise, Kenny. Did you see that? I remember a person one time I was preaching somewhere, I don't remember where it was at. And I read some passage of scripture, something on this order said, Arise, Kenny, and da da ba ba. When I got done, somebody met with me and they said right there, Hey now, what do we mean, Arise? Kenny? You're adding words to scripture. You put your name in there. I know your name's not in there. And I said, Oh, I'm sorry, you don't see yours. I think we should see our name arise and shine. For the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. So we are to reflect then that glory. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. See, that's not good news if we just leave it there. But it's something we should not ignore. We should approach and we should look at it and we should pray about it. And we should say, Lord, what are you saying here? He said, gross darkness the people. But I like the next word it says, but. You know, in Scripture, over and over, it goes on. He says, it, but it gives you some, maybe some bad news, as it were. But then it says, but. And so I like to read on. It says, but the Lord shall arise upon thee with his glory. <laughs> his glory shall be seen upon thee. Isn't that wonderful? And the Gentiles to the brightness of thy rising. I mean, there's all kind of information that is talked about here. The Lord shall arise upon thee and His glory. Not your glory. You have no glory. A lot of time we like everything pointed to us and all about it. It's not about us. It's the Spirit of the living God that's living inside of you, living inside of me that needs to come forward. The Gentiles are going to come in. In other words, they, the Gentiles are those maybe not believing the way you believe or, you know, if other people have made that decision, they'll see something in you and they'll want that. And it's certainly not you. It's not me. It's Christ who lives within, right? He's, he's our hope. And they'll want to come in to the brightness of thy rising. The kings are going to come in. That means the great men of the earth before Jesus comes, there's going to be some great kings. Great men, as it were, that we look at in the world today are going to come in and grab a hold of this message of the three angels and they're going to go give it to the world and people are going to listen to them. Man, what an awesome time that is that we're living in. Are you reflecting the glory of God? So I just say again, all around us now, the world is in turmoil. 
I mean some bad turmoil. We mention a few of them. Everybody mentions them and talks about them. But, you know, there's some people who's got their head in the sand and they just don't, you know, sometimes they're just uh, maybe not thinking along we are. We think about uh, bad COVID-19. We understand that the economy is in trouble. We say it's hanging by a what? It's hanging by a thread. It could snap any day. And then what are we going to be doing? Oh, we think it's bad and horrible right now. But, you know, it's going to get darker. Things are going to get worse before they get better, before Jesus comes. Many millions have lost their job. They've lost their income. They've lost their, and we call it employment. And now there's rioting and there's, you know, drive-by shootings. Uh, little children are being killed. There's heartache and there's pain. There's suffering. Sheer old murder. Loss of home. People are losing their home because they don't have a job. They don't have money coming in. Even nature is rebelling under the weight of sin. Many have lost hope. Many have lost encouragement. It seems like there's no one out there who wants to give you hope. No one wants to give encouragement. No one, because as soon as you mention, well, how are you doing? Well, I wasn't feeling very good. They'll tell you how bad they're feeling. I think you got that. And so we, we need to look beyond. We need to be a hope. We need to be a light in a dark world. And because it seems the majority of the world, not everybody's involved in what I'm getting ready to say here, but I understand because there's so much going on that the enemy has such a hold on this world that we realize that many have lost their hope and they turn to other things. They turn to alcohol and they turn to drugs and they turn to make bad choices and they turn to bad company. And things only get worse for them. These folks need a light, the light of the world. They need that bread of life. Isn't that wonderful thing about that bread of life? It makes me hungry. It makes me want to thirst after righteousness when you think about the bread of life. We know that is none other than what? Than Jesus Christ. We must give them. We must introduce them to Jesus. Tell them. You know what people's wanting to hear today? People's wanting to hear. I want to hear. I need to hear it. I need to read it from the Word of God. When people are going through such times as we're going through right now, there, ooh, there is a bomb in Gilead. There is a bomb in Gilead. There's healing that he has for us. Healing of the sin-sick soul. We have a great, mighty physician. One that knows all about you and all about me. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's victory, we know, that in the blood of the Lamb. I think that's the way that song goes. It's a beautiful song. He knows all about you. He knows what you have need of. This physician that's waiting just for you to call. Just for you to call out, Lord, I need some help. I can't handle it anymore. It's too much. Do you realize how suicide rates are just climbing and climbing and climbing? Because we're entering and in that dark period and we're not looking for that light there's a physician that can handle handle and heal all manner of diseases whether it be mentally physically spiritually financially it doesn't matter nothing is too big for God I think that's just awesome to think about nothing's too big for God but he's waiting for you to call and I just wonder will you call if you don't call he's not going to answer I think today would be the day to call on him because you may fit in some of these things we've been talking about here. You've noticed the world getting dark. You've noticed the coldness of the heart. You've noticed the laziness in the church, the coldness, and you're looking for something a little bit different right now. We need Christ. The days are dark. Warning after warning is given in Scripture. Praise God for that. And over and over we go back what you know and you've read all the time. Maybe we've read it too many times, some have, and we've just thrown it out. We've ignored it. As it was in the days of Lot, as it was in the days of Noah, the condition of the world just before Jesus comes. Man, we can know. We can know where we're at in the stream of time. The Bible tells us in these last times, 
when I talk about Satan, I talk about the man of sin will work with all power. How do we know that? Well, because the Bible says 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. It says, even him whose coming is after the working of whom? After the working of Satan will, will with all power and signs and notice this, lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that what? In them that perish. We're going to be what? We're working to be saved, as it were, by the grace and blood of Jesus Christ, or we're going to be lost. We're going to be perishing because the devil says, I'm going to try to take you down. I'm going to work signs. I'm going to be working miracles, lying wonders. I'm going to deceive anybody and everybody I can. Uh, Unrighteousness is them that perish. You don't have to be in that boat. And then the next word says, because. I like that. Because, notice this, because they receive not a love of the truth that they might be saved and so again the question has to come back have no do you have a love for the truth i mean do you really love it man if you ask somebody sitting in the pew next to you you talk to your neighbors and your friend mom and dad whatever it might be family you love jesus oh we love jesus we love jesus sometimes we can question some of these things and we might question ourselves we just need to do a little you know uh, self-examination here Did we spend time in prayer this morning? Well, no, we went to work and we work at a religious place and bum, bum, bum. That, that's a, that doesn't take the place of it. Did you read scripture? Did you get something, you get a foundation on which, you know, to build on today? Because you ought to know that the devil is going to try to, may I say beat your socks off? Yeah. He's going to try to work you over. And we need to build a good foundation of a morning so that he can't take us off of that. To know what the truth is is so exciting to me to develop a love for that truth. You love truth more than you love life itself. Wow. So are we doing that? Are we doing what is necessary that we may gain the victory? We can know the work of the enemy. We can know his plan. We can know where we're at in the stream of time as the darkness continues to increase. And what do I mean by that? The darkness is increasing. We can say dark when people's looking outside and say, man, is it getting dark outside? Listen to the spiritual darkness of air, the spiritual darkness of heresies, spiritual darkness of delusions, along with, may I say again, the lukewarmness, the, you know, we talk about heresies, don't care attitude that seems to be sometimes facing us. Satan is leading the world captive. Don't be his victim. You don't have to be his victim. I don't have to be his victim. But he's leading the world right down a a path that we'll never come back from. We need some help. We need some power from on on high. So how can we fight this, as it were, in the Word of God? In John chapter 3, verse 19, the Bible's clear on it. John chapter 3, verse 19, the Bible says... And this is the, notice this, condemnation that, notice, light is coming to what? The world and men love, uh uh-oh, men love what? Darkness rather than, huh, than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. I mean, that's a powerful passage of Scripture right here. We have what? We have light that's in the world. We have the Word of God that's here, right? We have time. We can get into the Word of God. We have the power of the Holy Spirit that can illuminate these beautiful truths of God's Word in here, can convict and convert and change the heart and change the life, and yet many refuse it. They don't want it. Why? Oh, they love darkness. They love evil. But you know, God can reverse that. I've said this many, many times, and I I do believe it. I'm not trying to be smart about it. But I really believe that Satan has joined the church. Is it okay to say that? I believe that Satan has joined the church in that that he's bringing in apostasy. He's bringing in over and over the traditions of men. And this develops into darkness as deep as, as midnight. No, I know that's heavy duty, but you know, it's things that we need to be thinking about here. If he's joined, if he's coming in through apostasy and traditions of men, 
How does he do that? Well, sometimes we find many times it's because things, things we go to read sometimes. Somebody said, well, that's changed now for some reason. We can't get the full context of it for some reason. Or maybe we don't care. It's developing the darkness. And it doesn't need to be in the church. The devil needs to be disfellowshipped. No, nope, somebody will get that one. We have to realize the time that we're living in is a night of trial. It's a night of going to be a persecution. It is for many right now. It's a night of separation. It's a night of, of tears and even death. Why? All because what? Because we love the truth. I mean, do we really love the truth? Are we willing to give our lives for the truth? Are we willing to live the truth? Maybe sometime we've become so lukewarm and just so, you know, just kind of out of it so much, yet claiming that we are Christ right here. Maybe we don't see. Maybe our conscience has become severed with a, maybe with a hot iron. But, you know, we don't have to walk in this darkness. Because the Bible tells us so. Let's, let's read a passage, shall we, in John chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12 says this. I like the way it starts out. It says, then spake Jesus again. Don't you love it when Jesus, he spoke again. He said, he speaks to us again. He says this. Jesus pointed to himself. He said, I am the light of what? Of the world. He that followeth me shall what? Huh. Not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Man, what, what a guarantee. Jesus says if we follow him, we will not walk in what? We will not walk in darkness, but we're going to walk in light. You, you have a choice there. You can walk in darkness. You can walk in light. Jesus says, I've come. I've, I've set an example for you. We're told there, it, it, we're to walk the way that he walked. And yet you point that out in Scripture. And many people say, well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to walk that way. The way we get to heaven is following God's plan and only following God's plan. How can we say that we love Jesus? How can we say we want to follow Jesus? How can we say we want to go to heaven, but yet we dismiss the words of Scripture? We feel like we no longer have to do that when we know they haven't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. My Bible is very, very clear. Out of darkness, God's light is going to shine. Man, we have this guarantee of Scripture. For those of you maybe who are fighting it and you're, you're living in darkness and people we've worked with even this week, is have, they're having all kind of troubles internally and externally too and they don't know which way to turn. They're ready to give up. They're thinking about suicide. They've quit eating. They just don't want to live anymore. This is reality. But God sends help along the way. God's wanting to shine light in our pathway. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Notice this, for God who did what? He commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our, notice this, in our hearts. Notice this. It's in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Man, what a passage of scripture right now. The world said we don't know God. Disciples said, we don't know God. Do you remember how they said, we don't know God? We're not, we're, not, we're not familiar with God. And Jesus said, man, have I not been with you so long? If you have seen me, you have what? Good. You have seen the Father. Jesus came. Do you notice that? We, could, we have a, the knowledge, the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Jesus and certainly you can see God. The light has come. We need that light. Powerful verses when you go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter uh, 1, verses 2 and 3. We want to read that now. Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. These are very familiar, but no, this is going back, back in the beginning. The Bible says, and the earth was without form and void, right? You knew those, didn't you? Genesis 1, 2 and 3. And notice this, and darkness was upon the face, what? Of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the what? Good, the face of the waters. And God said, notice this, let there be light. And what happened? And there was light. My, in this time of spiritual darkness, we need the Word of God. We need the power of God in our hearts and in our life. We need that light to shine on our pathway. Why? As we mentioned, simply to shine the light on the path, so we know where we're at on the stream of time. 
so that we can be sure that His coming is near, even at the door. This is not something that people have been just talking about. What's happening in the world today has never happened like this before. Not to this extent. And certainly that should wake us up out of our sleep as sleeping maybe church members, a sleeping world. Even the world, have mercy. Even the world says things are happening we can't even explain. We don't know what it's all about. You know what it's about. Your obligation and my obligation is to make others aware of it. That's our job. That's our commission. We've accepted that, have we not? When we accepted the call of Christ, when God, what God called, oh, you, out of what? Out of darkness into that marvelous light. He called you. He equipped you. He sustains you. Now he says, God, you have it, now go give it to someone else. Man, this is the hour to do it. Please don't put it off another day. Don't put it off a, a week. Don't say it doesn't matter right now. It does matter. Time is of the essence. A time of spiritual darkness. We need the Word of God to shine like it's never been, <laughs> never been before. Shining a bright light on the Word of God and giving us courage and faith and hope to follow that Word. We need the understanding. And we can know. The, uh, some of us have forgot. In the Advent movement, sometimes we forget the blessings that God has, has I mean, He's just bestowed upon us as a people. We have forgotten the light that He has shown in our pathway that we're to give to the world. They, the world doesn't know many things that you know, that the Holy Spirit has enlightened you with. You want to be part of God's remnant church. We have a remnant message to give to the world, and we need to be giving that like never before. We need to know that the Word of God has lined out and laid out for us in no uncertain terms where we're at in the stream of time. Jesus made it so plain. He said, you, you'll know when it's even at the door. You're going to know, you know, when the leaves are on the tree. You're going to know how close it is. And then the uh, comes back question, am I ready? Am I really ready or am I just playing church? Huh. Am I just dressing up for church? Have I really been converted? Do I really remember when that conversion took place? Hmm. I'm wondering if we haven't, we, didn't, we don't remember what took place. Maybe it didn't take place. But it needs to take place. We must be born again, the Bible says, if we're to enter the kingdom of God. That simply means to me that your old taste and your old habits and your old desires, they have to be gone. Mine do. They have to be dead. They have to be buried. And there's only one that can do that. But he's willing to do that regardless of your lifestyle, regardless of where you've been and what you've been doing. God is willing to take you right back into the fold. I mean, to me, that's just good news. Now is the time for us, in Isaiah 60 we talk about, to rise and to what? And to shine. Why? Rise and shine with what? We have something to give? No, you have nothing which to give. We rise and shine because the light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. This is what we need in the church. This is what we need in the world. This is what we need in everyday life. We need the glory of the Lord, the Spirit of God living inside of us and coming out to where people can see that there's a Spirit of God inside of you. They can see, they can tell by looking. Remember, they're going to look and see something good for you and me. They're not going to see anything good in me. I want them to see Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. Let them come rise and shine. Let the glory of God just come down. Get on your knees and beg for it if you haven't done it in a while. Oh, God, let me be a reflector. Let me reflect your glory. Let me reflect your power. It's risen upon me. That's a promise that God says, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you this. Just carrying on just a little bit more. That was Isaiah 60 on verse 2. Again, it says, Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. And what? Gross darkness, the people. We read it a moment ago. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and His glory shall what? Be seen in thee. That's God's plan for you and for me. Remember, self is going to have to die somewhere along the line. Even in ministry and work, there's too many... Oh boy, be careful. There's too many people selfish. We try to put self in the work. 
And God tells us plainly that if any I or little, any kind of self is in the work of God, he does not accept it. So I don't know about you. I have to pray about it. Self is my biggest enemy. Now don't sit there and laugh. Self is your biggest enemy too. This is what it's about. That's why Jesus said when you come to him, he said, deny what? Come on. Good. Deny self, take up the cross, and follow me. Unless you deny self, you're not about to take up the cross. You're not about to follow him until self is dead. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to come in and say, Oh, Lord, get rid of self. I don't want anybody to see me. Man, I lead them astray. I want them to see Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ is living in your heart, you don't go around touting it and blowing your own trumpet and your own horn either. One lady said to me, so I met for the very first time, and she said to me, well, my, my, my. She said, I haven't sinned in seven years. And I said, if you haven't sinned in seven years, you just did. Okay, I'll leave it at that. You think about it. Certainly that's the goal and the objective is to live, right, victorious life. But we're not going to be around toting and talking about it all the time and telling others about it. It should just show in your life, should it not? Sure it should. It's natural. It just comes out. What is this darkness? Think about it. What is this darkness that it's talking about? It said darkness shall cover the earth and what? And gross darkness the people. Again, with spiritual application here, this darkness, what is it? Listen, we've read many times, and you've read it, I'm sure, and you've studied it. It's a misapprehension of what? The character of God. People don't understand God. They think He's a tyrant, think He's, you know, it's, it's, it's bad news. But God said there'll be a people that I will appoint here in these last days. They need a knowledge of His character, and it's to be made known. His power to save, His grace, His mercy. His power, His long-suffering, His goodness, His mercy. This message is to lighten the world. And certainly we will do it. It's not on the screen. It won't be, but I want you to read. I don't think we'll have time in this Revelation chapter 18 when that fourth angel comes down and lightens the world. We will see these truths come to life. This next passage, I'm going to get ready to read here in just a moment, Luke 21, verse 26. I want to say this, and I want you to understand what I'm talking about here. When I say this, there's no usefulness for this passage of Scripture. Oh, yeah, I got some of you riled up already. Good. Maybe it woke you up. There's no usefulness, This notice this, for the Christian. Notice how I'm, as I read that. Because... We're talking about scripture, the life here in Luke 21, verse 26. The world is heavy and the things that are heavy. The Bible said men's heart are failing them for what? Good, for fear, for those looking for after those things which are coming on the earth. Men's heart are doing what? Men's hearts are failing them for fear. As a Christian, right, we should not have fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. We can be concerned, absolutely. We can spend time on our knees. We can certainly be concerned. The Lord, am I, am I in a saving relationship with you? What do I need to be prepared? Where would you have me to be? Where should I be in this part of earth's history? I, well, I want to stay here because my family's here. That may not be good enough. Well, I want to do this because that's what I feel like I want to do. God may ask you to do something you don't want to do. It's going to really test your character. It's going to test mine. The world's falling apart. We don't know what's going to happen next. But men's heart failing them for fear. It should not happen in the Christian life because we know that He's always there for us. The world and the church is in serious trouble. Is it okay to say that? Well, I already did. The world and the church are in serious trouble. If we do not seek the old paths to dwell in. Too many things are changing and not for the good. God has warned us over and over in Scripture. How can He deliver any person who fails or refuses hmm, to heed these signs of the times? This is what they are. 
I'm, I'm, I'm assured based upon the Word of God over and over, he do, He's going to do everything He can to save me. He's going to do everything He can to save you. You must make that choice. You must make that decision. It can't be halfway. My, my, my. After all, you're going to repopulate heaven. I want to repopulate heaven. I have to be material, heaven material. And it's certainly maybe not the way we're walking around what we're doing today with all the thoughts and all the evilness and all the stuff that's going on. And We need some changes. We've got to get back to those old paths. But people are trying to block those old paths. But you know what? Stay in there. Present the message the way God gave it to us. Maybe we need today. Maybe we need a fresh vision. Maybe we need a fresh word from God. And maybe you've been getting day old stuff. Maybe you've not been getting a word from God at all. But you know what? Maybe today you need that. And I just want to just relate to 2 Kings a few moments. We have 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. I tell you, when I read this, I got so excited I couldn't hardly stand it. I just, and it's okay to get excited about the word of God. I got excited about it. Because why? Because I seen something. It was a fresh vision for me. It's something I needed in my life. And I praise God for it. It was about Elijah. You remember him and the servant? They were, you know... Surrounded by the enemy and there's no way out. And notice 2 Kings 6, 17 simply says this. And notice, and Elijah prayed. If you're in trouble, my brothers and sisters, remember what? First thing you do is you pray. First thing he did when his life was on the line, Elijah prayed. But notice that he prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, <laughs> the man that was with him, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, <laughs> notice this, and he saw, and behold, mountains. Notice this, mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elijah. Man, you talk about exciting right here. Life seems to be on the line. Elijah, the first thing he did was what? He said, met, met the sister, I'll pray. First thing we need to do, get on our knees and begin to pray. And notice, at that point in time, if I was surrounded by the enemy, and my life was on the line, I might be saying, Lord, help me. Help me out of this situation. But he asked, Lord, open the eyes, what? So the young man could see. He didn't even pray for himself. He prayed for somebody else because the young man couldn't see by faith. And God opened his eyes and he saw these horses, it says here, chariots of fire, angels that had surrounded Elisha. Just like they're surrounding you. Every day of your life, the angels of God are surrounding around you. They're, ooh, they're a hedge about Job. Remember, the devil said, man, get that hedge away and I can take him. Something like that. You remember? Take that hedge down. You put a hedge around him. How can I get to him? Why do we look at it and say, well, that's, that was for Job. That was just for Job. No, it's for you. And it's for me today to realize if we're obedient to God, doing the best we know how to do, right, by the grace of God, we're climbing that ladder by faith toward heaven. There's a hedge that's been put around you. The devil can't get to you the way he wants to get to you. He can't do what he wants to do to you. Think about that. Those angels, chariots, as it were, of fire. There's hostile environments. There's hostile elements all in the world today. They're all around us. Every day. Principalities and powers that we read in the Bible. Spirits of demons. Wicked spirits. But notice like in the day of Elijah when the servant pointed his master. He said what? There's that angry army. They've surrounded us. They're cutting us off. There's no way that we're going to make it. All opportunity has been shut off. Maybe you feel that way today. There's just no way. You're not going to make it. You're surrounded by the enemy. You're surrounded by so-called friends that leading you in the wrong direction. You're participating in things you know you shouldn't be participating in. We should pray. Elijah prayed. We need to pray that our eyes, spiritual eyes, will be open, that we may see that God is there for us. God cares for us. Pray, Lord, open my eyes. I want you to do that today. Lord, open my eyes that I might see. Heaven is right there near to us. We have 
fear, nothing to fear when we go do what God asks us to do. Oh, yeah, the world may turn on you. Oh, the church may turn on you. Different people may turn on you. But God will not turn on you when you do what God asks you to do and you know it based on His Word. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, I like this. It's good for us. The Bible said, He that hath an what? He that hath the ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the what? To the churches, to us. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Man, I, I see victory here. I, I smell victory. I sense victory here. If you have an ear, please open them up. You have eyes that's been blind and you've been not wanting to see things that are going on that should be taken care of in and among and around God's people, ask Him to open your eyes and give you that spiritual insight. That sin needs to go out of our lives so we can be like Jesus. Could it possibly be? Could it possibly be that the darkness covering the whole earth right now is so close to the time of Daniel chapter 12, verse 1? Remember Daniel 12, verse 1 says there's going to be a time of trouble. Huh. At that time of trouble, what's going to happen? Michael's going to stand up, that great prince that standeth for the children of thy people. Are you ready? Are you ready for that, really, that time? If you have an ear to hear, if you have eyes helping to be opened up, spiritual ear, spiritual eye, spiritual mind, because we're in that time, and it's going to increase as we go on. And I want you to be ready for that day. <clears throat> And by the grace of God, I know that you will be. You're making a decision right now. I know that you are. And there's going to be a song I, that, I, that I want you to hear because I, I like this song. It's uh, Go Light Your World. Our, our, our world needs to be lit up, don't you believe it? By Celestine Dickerson. And Tim Parton's going to accompany her. Now, I know you'll enjoy this song. I do. Sit back and listen and enjoy. Some brightly burning, some dark and cold. There is a spirit who brings a fire, ignites a candle, and make his home. Frustrated brother, see how he strives. Light his own candle some other way. See now your sister, she's been robbed and lied to. Still holds a candle without a flame. So carry your candle. Raise our candle and light up the sky. Bring to our Father in the name of Jesus. Make us a beacon in darkest times. So carry your candle around to the darkness. Seek out the hope. Deceived and poor, hold out your candle for all to see it. Take your candle and go light your world. Take 
Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Appreciate that song so very much. Celestine Dickens, Brother Tim Parton, always a blessing. God is so good, isn't he? We need to go light the world by the grace of God. I'm wondering, is there someone right now that you, you, just, you, just, you want to light your candle? You want to go tell others that Jesus is soon to come? What an opportunity, what a privilege right now that we can take these words of this song. We can take them to the Lord in prayer. Say, Lord, I, I need my candle relit. I need to be what you want me to be. And I want to help to light the world. We have a message to give like no other. No other folks in this whole world. It's a life and death issue. And I'm going to invite you to respond. Before we have closing prayer, I just want to invite you to respond to the call that the Holy Spirit is making on your life right now. Respond by just saying, yes. Yes, Lord, I'll follow you. Wherever you lead, I'll follow you. Whatever you've asked me to do in your word, I know you'll give me strength and power to be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Will you accept him as Lord and Savior right now? Will you confess your sins? The Bible said if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Lord, how we need to be cleansed, how we need to be washed. We can be washed in your blood. We can be washed by the blood of the Lamb. We can be washed by the Word. So we pray right now you've made that decision that you said, I'm going to follow Jesus wherever He leads. I want to have prayer for each one of you. I didn't say it'd be an easy decision that you've made, but it'll be one that God will honor. It'll be one that God will help you to make sure that you follow through. Only He can help you. Shall we pray together? I'm just going to kneel. Where it's possible, you might want to kneel. If you can't, it's okay. But we're going to kneel and pray for this decision. Merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. Thank you for that beautiful song that invites us to light the world. We can't do it without you. We need you. There are those who have made that decision right now. And Lord, for those who have made that decision to follow you, we pray that your Holy Spirit now will comfort them, encourage them, give them the victory that they need so that heaven can be their home. Bless us, we pray. To this end, we thank you. We give you praise, give you honor, and give you glory. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and we're glad and so happy that you decided to join us on 3ABN Worship Hour. Again, we thank you for your love, your prayers, your support of this station to keep this message going till Jesus comes. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next time.